Awesome. I'm just letting everybody trickle in here. I see we've got some people logging in. Give it a couple of seconds. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Still see people logging on, so I'm just going to give everybody a few more moments. Cool. I'm glad that, that everybody's turning out on like a Thursday afternoon. This is awesome. All right. Well, I am going to get everybody started and, and welcome everybody. So hello and welcome to the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Uh, thank you for coming to our panel today, Protecting Vulnerable pop Populations Under the New Toxic Substances Control Act. My name is Maddie Lees. Um, I am a 1L PILC representative here at UL Law, and I'll be moderating this panel. Just have a few announcements, um, and then we'll get started. Um, a couple of technology notes. Don't worry if you can't see yourself because this is a Zoom webinar, so all the attendees are automatically muted with videos off, um, so you'll only be able to see our panelists. Um, and throughout the panel, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, all of our panelists will be giving their presentations, and then there will be a 15-minute Q&A session at the end where the panelists will answer your questions. Um, please remember to be courteous of all viewpoints throughout the presentation and Q&A session. Additionally, if there are any legal professionals in the audience wanting to earn CLE credit for this panel, we'll drop a document link in the chat that has a link to register and pay on drop form. Um, also, our alumni board, Friends of Land, Air, Water, helps to provide stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. And if you're interested in making a donation to help provide students with those stipends, um, the information to do so will also be on that same document that dropped in the chat. Um, lastly, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coastal reservation, coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Silitz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Hope would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people in the Willamette, Willamette Valley and express our respect to, for the tribal nations of Oregon. I'll now introduce our panelists. Um, first, we have um, Diane Barton, and she is the Water Quality Coordinator at the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, where she provides technical expertise related to water quality, environmental toxics, regulatory processes, and the fate and transport of contaminants. The Intertribal Fish Commission is a technical support and coordinating agency for its member tribes' fishery management programs. Diane also serves as the chairman of the National Tribal Toxic Council, which is an EPA tribal partnership group for the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxic. Key issues for this group include advocate, advocacy for programs to minimize the disproportionate exposure of tribal members to toxic chemicals, increasing tribal capacity to monitor resource, natural resources for toxic chemicals, and enhancing tribal consultation on chemical risk management and pollution prevention policies. Diane holds, holds a PhD in geochemistry from the University of Arizona and is a member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior, Superior Chippewa. Um, our, our next panelist is Bob Sussman. He is the principal um, at Sussman Associates, a law and consulting firm that offers advice and support on energy and environmental policy issues to clients in the nonprofit and private sectors. Bob serves as counsel to Safer Chemicals Healthy Families, a coalition of nonprofit environmental and public health groups. He was deeply involved in the recent bipartisan overhaul of the Top Toxic Substances Control Act and is now immersed in implementation of the new law. Bob was co-chair of the Obama transition team for EPA and then senior policy counsel to the EPA administrator from, uh, administrator from 2009, 2009 to 2013. He also served in the Clinton administration as EPA deputy administrator, and he has been an adjunct pro professor at the Georgetown University Law Center, a guest lecturer at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and a visiting lecturer at Yale Law School. Bob was a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in 2008. And he also recently served on the Board of Environmental Sciences and Technology at the National Academy of Sciences, and now serves on the boards of Chesapeake Legal Alliance and the Manufacturing Policy Institute. And he's also a federal commissioner on the Interstate Commission for the Potomac River Basin, to which he was appointed by President Obama. Um, he graduated magna cum laude uh, in 1969 from Yale College and, a 19, and was a 1973 graduate of Yale Law School, where he was an editor of the Yale Law Journal. Bob clerked for federal district judge Walter K. Stapleton. Um, he was also a partner at 
DC from Covington and Burling um, and chair of the DC environmental practice at Latham and Watkins from 1987 to 93 and 95 to 2007. Bob's written numerous articles and blogs on environmental issues, including climate change and chemical risk management. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to our panelists. Thank you so much for attending today. I'm getting a uh, disabled screen sharing when I try to share a screen. Okay, one sec. Um, can I ask my technical backup to help us out with that? Or you can show the slides if you or like. I can. Yeah. It's uh, it's up to you. Okay. Um. Let's do that. One Sorry, second. would you try screen sharing again? That we just there you go. It. Okay, it's great. Working. Thank you. Hold on, share, and then I'm going to put that there. In. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you and for your time. Uh, as you will see, I think Tosca deserves uh, uh, more attention as it holds much promise for protecting tribal resources and the health of sensitive populations. We need to talk about Tosca. Tosca is the Toxic Substances Control Act. And I hope to inspire you as young legal professionals to support the aspirational intent of this legislation. Unfortunately, like the character Bruno in Disney's Encanto, Tosca, while being one of the most powerful environmental laws, has been kept hidden in the secret passages and no one wants to talk about it or use its power. So let's talk about it and why it matters to tribes and why it should be more of a focus to the environmental movement. You're probably very familiar with the Clean Air Act and all it's accomplished in lowering pollutants since 1970. You're probably also very familiar with the Clean Water Act and all it's accomplished since 1972, when dipping your hand in the Cuyahoga River looked like this, and if it, if it wasn't already on fire, and it's now in its 50th year. But what do you know about Tosca? Tosca was intended to be the primary means of regulating the production and use of industrial chemicals and should have served as a gatekeeper for controlling chemicals. The Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act only take effect after chemicals are released and does nothing to prevent future damage. Tosca is also important because its authority transcends environmental media, unlike the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Oh, let me push that back a little bit. Um, Tosca has the authority to look at hazards comprehensively through their entire life cycle. We know through, though that hazardous industrial chemicals are ubiquitous in society and the environment despite Tosca. 1976 Tosca is considered to be a failure for the reasons listed here. Many people in the environmental movement and the general public think that engaging on Tosca is simply not worth the time. Tosca risk evaluations looked primarily at general population exposures and was required to choose the least burdensome alternative based on cost benefit analysis. Companies were allowed to shield information from third parties and the public. For new chemicals, EPA could not require industry testing without already showing there was a risk. Today, there's 40,655 active chemicals in commerce with about 400 new chemicals introduced each year. And this is why I'm encouraging you to talk about Tosca. Much of this changed in 2016. The Lautenberg Act passed both houses of Congress with overwhelming bipartisan support. Tosca risk evaluations are now required to consider potential risks to human health and the environment, specifically including potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations. Congress is so intent on this new touchstone for Tosca that it uses this term 18 times in the Lautenberg Act. Tosca now excludes consideration of costs or non-risk factors when reviewing safety, and it expands the categories of who may have access to confidential business information to states and tribes. Why do tribes in particular care about Tosca? Lautenberg defines potentially exposed susceptible subpopulations as a group of individuals within the general population that have either greater sus susceptibility or greater exposure. 
The National Tribal Toxics Council contends that for environmental exposures, tribes may, serve, may represent a potentially exposed susceptible subpopulation as required by law. But so far, EPA and other agencies have failed to account fully for native, pe native people's unique lifeways and treaty reserved rights to harvest that set them apart from the general population and from various other subpopulations. There's 575 sovereign nations living throughout the United States, many recognized by formal treaties. Tri tribal people are indigenous to their homelands and they use unique harvesting practices in these places throughout the United States. Tribal exposures often differ qualitatively and quantitatively from the general population exposures that are assumed by agency risk assessors. A typical conceptual model of exposure to contaminants in the environment might look like this, where the interaction with the, of people with the environment looks outdoorsy, but these environmental exposures are being evaluated through a recreational lens where suburban people might occasionally swim, go to the beach, fish, hike, and hunt, but primarily live in urban areas and consume food that is sourced from a wide geographic area. TOSCA risk assessments generally assume general or central tendency characteristics for exposure. Tribal lifeways, on the other hand, involve exposure to chemicals in the environment that are much more than recreational. Native American people's connection to place means that unlike the average American, they will often reside in one location, their reservation, village, or community for their entire lives and harvest and use resources from that one area. Their lifeways will involve interaction with and use of those particular lands, waters, and resources. This conceptual model attempts to show how tribal lifeways are very closely associated with the environment through subsistence harvesting of fish, game, and plants, and cultural practices like pottery making and basketry, and reliance on small rural or private wells. And subsistence is not an Anglo bear eking out idea of a miserable existence. Native understanding is that subsistence, the acts of hunting, fishing, and gathering, coupled with the seasonal cycle and ceremonies, are intri intrinsically woven into the cultural and social life of Native people. A Yakima elder says, it is a way of life, more than a livelihood, something handed down through generations. Here, tribal people are dip netting salmon from the Columbia River as they've done since time immemorial. Exposure to water and consumption of aquatic foods in this sense is not recreational or incidental, and it can result in much greater exposures than the general population. Fish consumption can be orders of magnitude higher for tribal people than it is for the general population. Tribal diets have high exposure and risk ramifications for both adults and children. The upper left picture here shows razor clam harvests, which may result in exposures to algal toxins like demoic acid. The upper right shows uh, a photo of muktuk. Muktuk is a traditional Eskimo dish made from frozen whale blubber, and muktuk has a high lipid content that may be associated with exposure to bioaccumulative contaminants, also the case for fish and fish eggs. This is a comparison of fish consumption rates for the average and 90th percentile for some Pacific Northwest tribes as compared to the general population. Clearly, there's a distinct difference in fish consumption shown here. The impact of using central tendency inputs in risk exposure assessments can be profound and results in risk estimates that can differ significantly when a fish consumption rate is varied. This chart shows how in 2010, the EPA evaluated the risks of a bioaccumulative flame retardant known as PBDE to the general population from fish consumption. EPA used central tendency instead of tribal tendency factors in that evaluation. By minimizing the risks from fish consumption in that 2010 exposure assessment, they instead focused on dust pathways as the primary route of exposure to people but dust could not explain the highest levels of PBDE that was found through biomonitoring in some people. These the risks then were some, subsequently ignored in that assessment. 
So what was the impact on the regulation of this chemical, which was allowed for use in children's pajamas, furniture, carpeting, and has been and continues to be widely measured in people and fish throughout the United States. No water quality regulations or criteria resulted for PBDE, no required monitoring, no basis for fish consumption advisories, no regulations or best practices for disposing of flame retardant bearing household products. Instead, many states enacted regulations instead of a federal rule, which led to PBDE eventually being voluntarily removed from commerce by manufacturers in 2013. Scientists believe that both exposure and susceptibility must be considered in order to accu accurately evaluate risks from toxic substances, and that these two are in fact often interrelated. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but this paper, and I strongly recommend looking at it, looks at impacts to populations that are either non-adverse or adverse from a chemical exposure. If a population has no co-exposure or biological susceptibility, oftentimes there's no adverse consequence for interacting with that chemical. If there's co-exposures but no biological susceptibility as shown here in the blue, sometimes at the higher end of the population, you get an adverse reaction. But if a population has both co-exposure and biological susceptibility, a much greater proportion of that population has an adverse reaction to a chemical. So looking at tribal susceptibility, tribal health disparities can mean greater population susceptibility. Indian countries more likely to suffer from certain health conditions, more likely to be sicker, have serious complications and die from them. Tribes live throughout the United States and access different geographic regions. This graph shows the incidence of stomach cancer for tribal people shown in a blue bar and white non-Hispanic shown in the purple bar living on tribal lands or sharing a boundary. Across all geographies, tribal populations are, less li are more likely to die from stomach cancer than non-Hispanic whites. There's also a poverty disparity that impacts the health of tribes as compared to the general population, regardless of location. Poverty rates for Native Americans, whether they live on reservation or in metropolitan area is significantly higher than the general population. Even if it were a choice, it's not a matter of moving to a different location to escape poverty and the increasing risks of disease associated with that. 40% of on-reservation housing is considered substandard compared to 6% outside of Indian country. Plumbing is associated with respiratory disease and mold can trigger asthma. Cold indoor conditions are associated with poorer health and increased risks of cardiovascular disease. Another health indicator can be related to task is older furnishings. Older furnishings can contain high levels of bioaccumulative flame retardants and potentially other types of treatment chemicals that are more likely to be entrained into dust. The data in this graph indicates that Native Americans, the second bar from the right, are less likely to purchase furniture or spend money on it. We should note that Tosca evaluations do not consider thrift stores as part of commerce. In speaking about health and tribes, it would be inappropriate to not mention the discrimination and exclusion that happened to Native Americans, including state sanctioned atrocities, genocide, forced relocation, separation of families from their children for boarding schools and more. This graphic ties adverse chemical experiences, ACEs, to epigenetic modifications and eventually to health disparities. In, in, so historical trauma has its own place in health disparity is documented by those who experienced it and by scholars and physicians, both tribal and non-tribal. Legacy use of a chemical is one that no, is one that is no longer active in commerce, kind of like those voluntarily recalled flame retardants I mentioned earlier. Legacy use is an environmental justice issue and it needs to be included in TSCA assessments. Under the previous administration, all 10 TSCA risk evaluations that were completed ignored exposure from legacy uses of chemicals. One of these was a flame retardant, HBCD, which is like the PBDE that I talked about before, that was pulled out of commerce and was already banned throughout most of the world under the Stockholm Convention. 
But this choice of ignoring legacy use was challenged in court and was recently affirmed by the Ninth Circuit that under TSCA, EPA did not have the discretion to omit any condition of use, including legacy use or associated disposal. So this is a crucial course correction for implementing TSCA. Higher exposure to legacy product does, products does just not occur in the home, but it can be magnified by tribes less protective disposal options and subsequent release to the environment from waste disposal. Disposal is part of a chemical's life cycle and can be regulated under TSCA. This is a scene from Alaska. On many reservations, all consumer waste products end up in tribal transfer stations and disposal sites. On tribal lands, landfills lack safeguards, particularly in Alaska, where unlined landfills and community burning is common and legal. Environmental releases occur from these disposal activities and tribal members are exposed again. Under the Biden administration, EPA is just now revising some of the TSCA risk evaluations done by the previous administration and is now working on fence line screening methodologies to capture potentially exposed susceptible subpopulations. And this is a start at fulfilling the aspirations of new TSCA. The first risk evaluations under TSCA generally did not assess air or water emission exposures to the general population under the assumption that these chemicals would be managed after being released into the environment by the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and other waste disposal regulations. Once again, not using the power of TSCA to prevent release in the first place. This approach was widely criticized and left some chemical exposure pathways to the general population unaccounted for, and also resulted in a failure of, to meet st TSCA's statutory direction to evaluate exposure to potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations, including fence line communities. So EPA has developed a screening methodology to examine whether that policy decision excluded risk, of, risk impacts to fence line communities. And again, while this is a good step forward to, for TSCA authority to control chemical release, version one of the proposed screening method only evaluates exposures and risks to human receptors in proximity to fence line releases, that air path on the right, or the water release to water bodies receiving industrial facility releases. It is only evaluating drinking water and incidental or recreational water exposures that I talked about. And plus the screening focuses only on industrial facilities that are not exempt from chemical data reporting requirements. The method also does not consider releases from consumer product disposal to online landfills or burning. So um, this methodology is currently open for review and comment right now. And, and you can uh, go to regulations.gov and put in let your voice be heard. Uh, the, sci the Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals on this uh, screening is meeting later this month. And you can support the comments that I've posted that are already posted here by the Environmental Defense Fund that find the review underestimates risks. Earth Justice says it fails to consider uh, pathways for many communities. The to Tribal Toxics Council put our uh, comments out there on Monday. And the American Chemical Council, you can read theirs. They want to know why uh, we don't go back to the agency's past practices of looking at general population exposures. Uh, so we know or seeing that just in conclusion that uh, protecting all people with one risk evaluation is not protecting the full population, but evaluating the risk of each group is another weight of effort, time and money. Capturing risks for everyone may not even be feasible, but this is the existing framework. Imagine if tribes were evaluated as the default population for certain chemicals of environmental concern. In that way, maybe we can conduct one evaluation instead of two, three, or 10. Finally, uh, I wanna stop here with a warning about new TSCA. It also preempts state authority to regulate chemicals. On the right-hand side of this, this side of your screen, uh, from safer states uh, shows uh, states that have policies for flame retardants and phthalates and plastics. So it's really important that the feds get this right and, and that the environmental movement finally takes notice of TSCA. So that's going to conclude my uh, 
comments and we'll turn this over to Bob. Do I have to hit exit or can, or can we hand this over to Bob? Um, I think if you stop sharing your screen and then Bob starts sharing his, he should be fine. Okay, I'm gonna, not sure how I do that. Let me see, oh, stop share, I see. There we go. Yeah, and then Bob should be able to go ahead. Okay, great. Um, you know, I, how did I end up on this? Uh, let me try again here. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, good afternoon to, uh, to all of you. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to follow Diane's excellent presentation uh, by focusing on uh, PFAS, Tosca and protecting community health. Uh, and I'm going to present uh, a North Carolina case study of law and science. It's, it's a case study where uh, I think you'll conclude that, that Tosca gave EPA tools that it could have used very effectively, but uh, didn't in, in this instance. And the end result was that uh, yet another vulnerable population in North Carolina uh, failed to get the protection from the agency that was available uh, under the law. Um, so just to back up, uh, I, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, with PFAS. And I know, Diane, you're very familiar with PFAS because it's an issue for uh, tribal communities. Uh, PFAS are a chemical class with unique properties that cause serious and, and widespread harm. Uh, they don't break up or degrade and are highly persistent. They build up in the natural environment and in biological systems. systems. Uh, they are highly mobile. Uh, we find them very extensively in the environment, in people's blood, uh, and in wildlife. Uh, they're universally detected in the blood of the general population. And this includes not only the U.S. population in the lower 48 uh, that live in urban areas and uh, are exposed to emissions and, and uh, many consumer products. Uh, it, it includes tribal populations uh, and other rural populations that live uh, far from the source of these chemicals, but are nonetheless exposed uh, through the food supply, um, through products that exist in their environment, uh, and, and also through long range uh, air transport of uh, PFAS emissions. PFAS are used heavily in many products with broad exposure. Uh, this includes carpet, clothing, cookware, cleaning product, food packaging, plastics, firefighting foam, and they're linked to many uh, serious health effects. So uh, PFAS are unique uh, among the chemicals that, that, that raise concern. Uh, and right now they're probably the number one uh, focus of, of regulators, not just in the United States, but, uh, but around the world. Um, But I, I want to focus on what we don't know about PFAS. PFAS is a large class of chemicals. Uh, EPA estimates that, estimates that there are uh, between six and 9,000 PFAS in use. Uh, up to now, the focus has been mostly 
on legacy long chain PFAS, formerly used heavy, heavily, but now phased out. And this would include uh, PFOS and PFOA. However, a new generation of short-term PFAS is replacing legacy PFAS. And these new PFAS are now showing up in products, uh, the environment, and people. Except for a few legacy compounds, there is very little data on the health and environmental effects of nearly all PFAS. And I want to underscore that uh, because the lack of data is a huge limitation in understanding how PFAS exposure is impacting vulnerable communities. Eastern North Carolina is, is an example of this. Eastern North Carolina, in many respects, is ground zero for PFAS contamination. Uh, the Camores, formerly DuPont plant in Fayetteville, is one of the largest PFAS manufacturing sites in the world. For four decades, the plant has discharged PFAS waste into the Cape Fear River. But this contamination was unknown to residents before 2018. The Cape Fear River is the drinking water source for 350,000 people. Numerous PFAS have been detected in drinking water, private wells, air emissions, locally grown food, and in the blood of residents. Communities who live in this area want to know how PFAS pollution has affected their health, but there are no good answers because of the lack of data. So how can Tosca help North Carolina communities? I wanna to touch on two provisions of the law that are, I think, important and, and underutilized. One is section four, which authorizes EPA to issue test rules and orders uh, that place testing obligations on chemical manufacturers. To issue test rules and orders, EPA must show first that a substance may present an unreasonable risk, and second, the data is insufficient to determine its effects on health and the environment. The statute authorizes EPA to require a diverse set of studies, including, for example, animal ep human epidemiology studies and animal testing. The second major provision I want to highlight is Section 21, which authorizes citizens to petition EPA to issue test rules and orders. EPA must respond to petitions in 90 days and citizens can challenge petition denials in federal district court. The court, if it agrees with the petitioners, can order EPA to grant the remedies that the petitioners requested. As Diane mentioned, Tosca also provides special protections for vulnerable groups or PESS with greater exposure or susceptibility to substances than the general population. The people of Eastern North Carolina who have been drinking uh, PFAS uh, for 40 years uh, and who have PFAS in their blood are definitely a PESS under Tosca. So why are the Tosca testing remedies important? With the tremendous data needs for PFAS, research by universities in the federal government cannot possibly supply all the answers. And that's why it's important to place the financial burden of testing on industry subject to strict EPA oversight. 
this is, I think, a critical outgrowth of the polluter pays principle because good stewardship requires industry to understand the impacts of its chemicals before they pollute the environment. And in this case, DuPont Comores avoided responsibility for testing while benefiting financially from 40 years of polluting activity in the Cape Fear River Basin. Unfortunately, EPA has a poor record of requiring industry to test under Tosca. There was virtually no testing under the old law. The new law gave EPA additional tools uh, that would make it easier to require testing. Uh, but even under the new law, very little testing has been required. The Section 21 petition process is an important tool for pushing EPA to use TSCA testing authorities to benefit at-risk communities. So that brings me to the testing petition uh, that was filed in North Carolina by six uh, local community groups. And I've, I've listed them here on the slide. Uh, this petition was driven by concerns about the links between PFAS exposure and diseases uh, in the local population and the lack of health effects data for diagnosis and, and treatment. Uh, in other words, uh, there's been a lot of exposure to PFAS, certainly. Uh, people in the community are, are sick. Uh, they all want to know, are we sick because of our exposure uh, to PFAS in our drinking water? And if so, um, how can we uh, use that knowledge for diagnosis and treatment? Uh, but right now, there are no answers. And so the petition uh, was filed as a way to get answers uh, to the questions in the community about the relationship between PFAS exposure and their health. The petition targets 54 PFAS produced at the Camores facility that we know are in waste streams, air, surface water, drinking water, and or human blood. The petition proposes compre a comprehensive testing program for PFAS, which was developed by experts retained by the community. It seeks issuance of rules or orders requiring Comores to fund testing, and it requests the establishment of an independent science panel to oversee that testing. So, to drill down a little more and explain the rationale for the petition, uh, the petitioners showed that information on the 54 PFAS is insufficient uh, because there is no health or environmental effects data uh, on many of the PFAS or on others. Uh, there may be available studies, but they are limited uh, and incomplete. Petition also showed that the 54 PFAS may present an unreasonable risk because their similarity to legacy PFAS with known harmful properties. So these are the two demonstrations, if you will, uh, that under the law need to be made uh, to justify a test rule and also need to be made to persuade a court to direct EPA to grant a testing petition. The proposed testing program includes experimental animal studies for major health effects, studies of mixtures representing real world exposure, human epidemiology studies on Cape Fear populations, fate and transport studies, and ecological effect studies. So let me tell you 
what has happened since the uh, petition was filed uh, in 2020. Um, first, uh, the petition was denied by the Trump administration. This was in early uh, 2021. The Biden EPA, uh, at the request of the petitioners, agreed to reconsider uh, the petition denial. Uh, there was strong support for granting the petition by NGOs, leading scientists, and the North Carolina congressional delegation. On December 28, 2021, EPA said it was granting the petition. But in reality, it refused to require all of the proposed studies. So the petitioners are now suing EPA and the Northern District of California to overturn the petition denial and compel EPA to require the requested testing. Um, I, I wanted to show you uh, this visual um, because. Uh, uh, it, it, I think, demonstrates how uh, unfortunately misleading and incorrect uh, uh, EPA statement that it was granting the petition uh, really was. And, and what you'll see uh, in the red here are the studies in the petition that EPA did not require, decided not to require. Uh, and then you'll see in the yellow, 3.2% uh, of the total testing, uh, which EPA did agree to require, although they had already announced earlier uh, that they were going to require the testing under their general PFAS uh, testing strategy. So. Uh, EPA said they wouldn't require epidemiology studies. Uh, they wouldn't require mixture studies. Uh, we asked for cancer studies on the PFAS with the greatest exposure. They did not require them. We asked for ecological and chemical fate studies. Uh, they said no to that. Uh, and then we asked for base testing on the 54 PFAS and they said no to base testing on 47 of the 54 PFAS, uh, only requiring testing on seven PFAS that they had already uh, committed uh, to require industry to conduct. So from our standpoint, whatever EPA said it was doing, the reality is that uh, they pretty much denied our petition across the board. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time on some of the key issues. Uh, the issues are pretty complex and we could talk about them for a long uh, period of time. And I really only like to focus on, on three areas uh, that I think will help you understand uh, the decision that EPA made here. Um, the first is EPA's uh, reliance on its general PFAS testing strategy. Um, EPA uh, has in fact uh, developed uh, in parallel with its consideration of the petition, an overall uh, PFAS testing strategy. And it claimed that the 54 PFAS in North Carolina would be adequately addressed under that strategy. However, the strategy doesn't focus on the PFAS to which North Carolina communities are exposed, but rather on other PFAS, which EPA believes are representative of 70 different PFAS categories within the broad total PFAS universe. Under the strategy, only 24 PFAS will be tested, including just seven of the 54 PFAS 
in our petition. EPA presumes it can determine how the 54 PFAS impact Cape Fear communities by, quote, extrapolating from data on other substances. But leading scientists disagree with this. And what they have said is that the testing strategy will have limited value in informing exposed communities about the health impacts of PFAS because the 24 test substances were selected without regard to whether they are widespread in the environment and human blood and contribute significantly to exposure and risk. Second issue is human epidemiology. And, and I, I want to emphasize that of, of everything that we asked for in the petition, this is probably the most important because uh, it, will, it will give us insights uh, into the relationship between exposure and disease and symptoms of disease in this large population uh, that we know has been heavily exposed to PFAS and drinking water and, and otherwise. Uh, so we asked EPA to require the company to conduct a comprehensive epidemiology study, but EPA said no. And its major reason uh, is that there are multiple epidemiological studies occurring in other regions of the country. And this is true, but these studies would not provide data relevant to Cape Fear communities because uh, these communities have distinct demographics and health conditions. They've been chronically exposed to high concentrations of a specific mix of PFAS uniquely associated with the Comores facility and its operation. And because their exposure has been by a specific set of drinking water and other pathways, including inhalation and consumption of local produce, fish and game that are unlikely to be found elsewhere. So the experts we have talked to believe EPA is on very weak footing uh, because other epidemiology studies are simply not going to be able to provide data which speaks to the North Carolina situation. The third big issue is requiring testing on, on mixtures. And our science consultants felt that testing of PFAS mixtures is critical to capture the interactions between the PFAS to which local populations are exposed. Users of contaminated drinking water consume several PFAS simultaneously, and when combined, these PFAS may have additive or synergistic effects, uh, but you can't determine that if you simply test individual PFAS uh, separately. So uh, EPA brushed off this argument as, as well. Uh, uh, and again, uh, we, we think EPA is on very weak ground. So what, what comes next? Uh, we are, uh, I think, committed uh, to go to stay the course uh, in, our, in our litigation. If we have to go to trial, we will go to trial. Uh, one advantage that we have is that under Tomaska Section 21, uh, courts do not defer to the agency, but they need to make an independent uh, determination of the merits of the petition. Even though the case is technical, I think we will have strong support from leading scientists. And just in closing, I would say that the mystery of this case is why an administration strongly committed to environmental justice and protecting communities from PFAS passed up an opportunity to do the right thing. 
Thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate it. Thank you, Diane. Um, while we do have a couple of questions from the audience, um, so I am going to um, click on them and hopefully they'll show up for everybody um, and then I'll read them out loud as well. Um, so um, Zach Griffin um, said, Mr. Sussman, can you expand on long range air transport of uh, PFAS? What is known about incineration of wastes that may contain PFAS? Um, besides incineration, what other activities result in air transport of these substances? Thank you. Yeah, well, um, incineration of, of waste that may contain PFAS is generally viewed as ineffective. And uh, often the effect of incineration is just to transform PFAS into other PFAS, which are then emitted into the into the environment. Um, so in incineration is 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 not an effective mode of disposal and may in fact uh, worsen the problem. Um, why is there long term long range air transport of PFAS? I think that that's uh, because PFAS are uh, uh, they don't degrade, uh, they don't transform in the air into other compounds, um, and therefore they can be transported over long distances. Uh, they're not unique in that respect because other substances can be transformed over long distances, but what we're seeing in PFAS is pretty much across the globe, we, we find them everywhere. And that occurs in non-industrial areas uh, like, the, uh, like the Arctic. Thank you. And then we have another question and it might be for both of you to weigh in um, from Craig Patterson. He says, I understand we've created over 100,000 man-made chemicals without understanding how they degrade or combine with other chemicals. Our domination and control has made guinea pigs of us all. Why didn't we adopt precautionary principle first? Do you have any insights? Diane? Well, I think I'll let you answer that one as well, Bob. Uh, uh, I've okay. seen your presentation on it. Okay, yeah. Well, um, you know, chemicals have provided important benefits to society and uh, uh, often uh, their, their economic and, and social benefits have uh, prevailed over environmental and, and, and health concerns. And uh, the only explanation I can give for that is it, it, it represents a social and uh, and political judgment. The comment I would make is uh, that when chemicals are introduced, uh, the manufacturers and often the regulators tend to assume that they are not harmful. And we discover that they are uh, many decades later. And, and so uh, uh, what we need to do is we, we, we need to conduct testing before we allow chemicals into the environment. Um, Tosca actually contains a pre-manufactured notification program that does give the EPA authority uh, to require testing, but uh, there, there too, EPA is doing a lot less than it should do. Let me just add, you know, the, the 1976 Tosca, and I pointed this out, had that cost benefit analysis in there, you know, so the importance of uh, the chemical industry to business was recognized at that time. I, I like what Bob said here. Why is this current administration that's committed or says they're committed to EJ, uh, you know, not doing the right thing? So. Thank you so much. Um, and then I, I had a question maybe for both of you. Um, just about the future of Tosca, and if um, this seems to be a legitimate way of moving forward, or if at some point groups will 
see like the need to to possibly challenge it and say we need to come up with something new and how likely that would be um obviously like the administrative hurdles and the pushback from the epa has seemed really hard to overcome um and i don't know if that this appears to be the only way forward to reg regulate toxic chemicals like this or if there are any other opportunities in the future well, I think the 2016 uh, reauthorization of TASCA, the Lautenberg Act, was important, and at that, you know, that put in the the protections for, for potentially exposed sensitive subpopulations was in there, and um, I think that was an attempt to make TASCA more effective. I, I just would like to see, and you know, and under the previous administration, that really didn't happen. So um, moving forward, it's interesting to see what's going to happen next. And uh, but this case that Bob is bringing is is just a good example of why you have to stay committed to this law and how it's being implemented. Yeah, hey, I would I, I would say the the 2016 amendments weren't perfect, but they strengthened the law in in important ways, and they gave EPA tools that could be used effectively uh, if EPA is is motivated to, uh, to do that. The, the Trump EPA uh, was not motivated. Uh, the Biden EPA, I think, is a more complicated proposition. Uh, they say some of the right things, uh, but uh, they're not, I think, living up to the potential of the law the way they, the way they could. Uh, that may be because of resources. Uh, it, it may be uh, because of uh, legal concerns. It, it may be because of uh, influence from people outside the agency. There are many, there are many out explanations, but uh, the bottom line is that they really, they really do need to do a better job um, than they're than they're doing. And if, if you just stay with me for another thirty seconds, I I wanted to mention that uh, EPA uh, a few months ago announced a a new PFAS roadmap, and uh, Michael Regan, the administrator of EPA, is from Eastern. North Carolina. He was the head of the North Carolina uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and he went down to Raleigh to announce the new uh, PFAS roadmap. And many of our petitioners were present to listen to what he had to say. And he gave an absolutely wonderful speech where he talked about the suffering of the local community and what they had endured. Uh, he talked about uh, some of the poverty that exists in that part of North Carolina, uh, uh, communities of limited means, both uh, communities of color and, and um, uh, Caucasian communities. And then, and then he said, look, we really understand what you've been through. And believe me, we have your back. We are going to protect you. Uh, we understand your pain. And so a couple of months later, this is the decision we got from EPA. Well, we will stay tuned to this lawsuit um, and, uh, and your and your guys' work on this. And I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. We've hit the top of the hour. Um, so I'm going to um, let everybody um, uh, take off but i just wanted to say thank you so much for your time um and for everybody that's still on um you can check out pilk.org p-i-e-l-c.org and we've got a brochure for the rest of the weekend um that you can check out all of the rest of our wonderful panels that um our call or our colleagues at uh, land air water at the university of oregon um school of law put on um again thank you bob and diane i really appreciate your time and energy um and your expertise um it's been fascinating thank you thank you so much have a great rest of your afternoon everybody bye bye bye, bye.